thank you everyone for joining us um, for this substantive but, but conversational look at the ins and outs of organizing at the state level to reform HIV criminal laws from the very advocates embroiled in this kind of work. Advocates from across the country, some of whom are from states where we'll see similarities in the political realities of their states, um, the advocacy ecosystems in those states, and also advocates from states where we'll notice um, some, some differences that I think will illuminate the discussion even further. Today you will hear um, an, uh, an overview of, oh, actually first let me go ahead and briefly introduce myself. My name is Amir Sadeghi. I'm the National Community Outreach Coordinator at the Center for HIV Law and Policy. Here's my email um, right there on the screen. So if you would like a video recording of this webinar to share with people in your networks or other advocates who you know were maybe um, under some kind of time commitment and couldn't make it to this live viewing, uh, you can reach out to me through email and I'll make sure that uh, you get that video recording. And today, you will hear from us an overview of guiding principles for building strong and informed local leadership and advocacy strategies to end disease-specific criminal laws. You'll learn about <laughs> reforms that didn't go far enough from experts in their states and what challenges follow from that. Tips on best practices for reform and engaging with legislators from a former state legislator. And following this discussion, there will be a web, uh, a question and answer session. I'll be looking at the questions um, you submit through that function uh, throughout the webinar, and I will uh, pose them to our panelists at the end. So first, we must give credit where it's due. The idea for the first webinar in this series of webinars came from the Positive Justice Project Advisory Group, which is a group organized to support, guide, and offer their lived experience and feedback to build a national strategy to end the criminalization of HIV and other stigmatized diseases and identities. The Positive Justice Project is a community-driven cross-movement collaboration to end HIV criminalization in the United States. You could find out more about the Positive Justice Project at our website, at the website for the Center for HIV Law and Policy, which is www.hivlawandpolicy.org. Um, thank you again to our PJP Advisory Group and its webinar planning committee for helping us put together this resource and guide for state advocates. And I'd like to give an opportunity for our panelists to briefly introduce themselves before we begin. So Latundra, will you start us off? You're on mute. Latanja, I believe uh, your microphone is muted. Just unmuted it, thank you. I'm Latanja Sockwell from Little Rock, Arkansas, and I'm happy to be part of the panelists today. Um, I am a HIV positive woman for the, since 2001, I think. And so this work means a lot to me because um, I could be one that's facing a criminal crime. Um, so I do this because I want to only not look out for myself, but others as well. And so anything that I can do to help, I'm willing to do that. Thank you, Latanja. Are we gonna? Uh, Mandisa, would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Mandisa Moro Neal. Um, I'm a civil rights attorney, a Black feminist attorney, working and based in New Orleans and doing work across the state. Um, I am also the litigation and policy director at Frontline Legal Services, which is an organization that mainly focuses on people who are incarcerated and living with HIV. I'm also a proud member of our state coalition, the Louisiana Coalition on Criminalization and Health, and the last of my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Thank you, Mandisa. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lauren Fanning. I'm from the state of Washington. Uh, I, started, I started working with people living with HIV uh, while I was living in San Francisco in 1981. 
at that time, stigma was everywhere and health equities was not even a conversation. All of our work was really focused on helping people as they were dying uh, and providing as much support as we can. Since then, I've worked in <coughs> probably just about every aspect of HIV work. Excuse me, I don't know how to get rid of that. <laughs> I've worked in every aspect of HIV that uh, I can think of from community education to case management. And I spent 14 years working with the Department of Correction in Oregon and Washington. It's where I became interested in working on HIV criminalization reform. And uh, have spent the last 10 years uh, advocating for that in our community. Thank you so much, Lauren. And finally, Jamo. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be with you. Um, I'm Jeanette Mott Oxford. I like to go by Jamo, and my uh, pronouns are Z, Zer, Zers. Um, I uh, blundered into public policy advocacy in the 1980s uh, when I accidentally joined a group that was an advocacy group. I thought that they uh, were, were a group that provided famine relief. Turned out that they wanted me to write my congressman, and I discovered I really liked doing that kind of thing. So I've done that either as a volunteer or a paid person ever since then. In the 1990s, I directed a statewide anti-poverty group that was a welfare rights organization. Uh, and then in the, in the, uh, from 2005 to 2012, I was a member of the Missouri House of Representatives, the first out lesbian to serve in the Missouri General Assembly. Uh, and then I moved on to work for Empower Missouri, which is a privilege to staff the Missouri HIV Justice Coalition. Um, we were invited to staff the coalition when another uh, organization uh, had, had to give it up for lack of capacity because of some work they were doing uh, uh, to, to become a, a, a more robust health center. Uh, and um, we have a history of working on human rights issues and evidence-based public policy. And we want to make sure that we end the stigma and change the law in Missouri. Great, thank you so much, Jamo. So to begin, Latundra, you're a member of the Positive Justice Project Advisory Group. Will you tell us a little bit about the guiding principles that the PJP Advisory Group has helped develop? Sure. Thank you, Amir. So I am um, on the PJP, PJP Advisory Group, and I also the co-chair of the Arkansas HIV Reform Initiative. So um, this group provides feedback and input on the PJB guiding principles. Um, so we come together to advocate for reform of laws that rely on a person's HIV status as proof of intent to harm. And we also oppose felony level punishments and long sentences that come with severe punishment from the criminal legal system. So most importantly, I think we need to remember the PJP advisory group supports broad, inclusive cross-movement collaboration. We believe in working with broad range of allies and communities affected by HIV criminal laws. This includes harm reduction advocates, sex workers, people fighting for racial justice and criminal justice reform in their states and people with direct lived experience. So this encompasses everyone. The first major takeaway from our cross-movement collaborative is we strongly favor reforming and amending HIV criminal laws rather than an outright repeal. We understand that it may seem counterintuitive, but the ultimate goal here is to ensure that we make a meaningful improvement in the lives of people living with HIV. So if we use Texas, for example, uh, as an example, they fully repealed their HIV criminal laws in the 90s. And so people living with HIV were still subject to being prosecuted through general, general crimes such as attempted murder and aggravated assault. Um, so we want to make sure that we're keeping everyone covered when we think about how to reform our laws. I know here in Arkansas, when Sanjay, I think everybody's heard of Sanjay Johnson's case, um, they wanted to consider his body a deadly weapon. So we have to as we're writing these laws, think about things like that as the, the, law, the people that are making the laws are gonna think about it. To make sure that this doesn't happen, we believe um, we should instead reform HIV criminal laws so that prosecutors have to prove specific intent to harm that the conduct posed was a substantial risk of transmission and that all transmission and that transmission occurred so we don't want to just make it seem like oh there was risk but 
we need to look at if the transmission actually occurred as well. Um, and we want the law to spell these things out so that prosecutors can prove these statements versus just um, going by what hearsay is. We also want to make sure that if a person undertook actions to prevent transmissions, um, if, if they wore a condom, if they um, used something else, some other kind of um, preventative, we want to make sure that those are considered when these laws are reformed. Um, that puts, um, that demonstrates lack of intent to harm when we um, can add these statements into those laws. We believe punishment should be appropriate or proportionate to harm, um, period. Um, we don't want someone getting a long sentence for um, possible possibly giving someone HIV um, when people can go out and murder someone and get less time for that. And so we want to make sure that the punishment is appropriate. We also believe that a reform of advocacy strategy should be did not reinforce the criminalization of people at the greatest risk of prosecution. That means the reform should work for all communities marginalized by criminalization, including the sex workers, communities of color, and people who inject drugs. So we also have to remember that this work takes time. We can't just do it overnight. We have to have planning bodies. And so getting our groups together, which has been difficult for us here in Arkansas, at least I thought it was until I started talking to my other um, state other state leaders and seeing that, you know, a small group can make a large impact, but we have to remain vigilant in our approach. And we have to like just stay on the course, even with it taking our group has been meeting for, I think, almost a year, and we've not made a huge impact, but that group, we've come together and we've, like, looked at other laws and things, and so we're making progress. It may not seem like a lot, but we're making progress, but we have to practice patience as we're moving forward. Thank you so much, Latundra. I, it, I think practicing patience is important, and, you know, I think, do you think that guiding principles like these are effective as resources and organizing tools to maybe jumpstart a, a coalition in a state? I definitely think these are these have been great resources for us here in Arkansas because it's ha helped us think about how we want to phrase things, what language to use, um, kind of how we want things to look so that we're protecting everyone in our state, not just a few people here and there. Yeah, Mandisa, you're an attorney in Louisiana, and, and um, you also mentioned that you're a member of the uh, Louisiana Coalition on Criminalization and Health. What role do you think legal literacy plays in fighting for reform? Um, well, to me, in, in my experience and my work, it plays a huge role in terms of that's one of the things that the, that policy and lawmakers are really um, depending on us not knowing how these things actually work and growing the idea that only people that have a JD or people that um, are practicing attorneys are the only people who can understand certain things about the law. And so to me, it's important like that we really unpack, um, demystify, complicate, and deconstruct that idea because it's not true. You know, like people who are experiencing the brunt of these policies know very well what's wrong with them and know very well what needs to be done like in order like, to make it less harmful. So part of how we do that is by like making sure that everyone in the coalition knows uh, what our current statute is, uh, but also why it's problematic and what needs to be uh, changed like to make it um, less criminalizing and to modernize it. And it can get um, very challenging in terms of well, I don't know about other states, I'm sure it's the same, but in Louisiana, a large number of the lawmakers are attorneys. And so sometimes, especially with this statute, which is under the criminal laws, that is used to, like I said, um, keep people um, ignorant and oppressed. 
So like, how, so it's also up to the people who do understand making sure that everyone talks about general versus specific intent. You know, uh, talk about may um, and shall and like all these other examples of things that we all understand. Um, also think that as, as was mentioned earlier, part of how we do that and make sure that everyone has the same understanding like of how these laws actually operate is we spent like a lot of time in our coalition talking about values and principles and making sure that we all understood that even though we all may think that the way to go about modernizing is different, our goal of stopping the criminalization of people living with HIV, that that's the same. And that we have the same purpose in stopping harm. Um, and also, you know, I'm sorry. It's okay, good. Like you said something. Um, and so I think that that has really been integral to our coalition as we're going against people who, you know, at the same time are dependent on us not knowing, they don't know anything about HIV. So at the same time that we are, like, are trying to make sure that everyone understands and has a um, um, level of legal literacy, we're also trying to educate lawmakers as well as, as a general public on what HIV in 2020 actually is as opposed to what people think it is. So it's also a matter of us. Um, how I see it is really flipping what it means to be an expert, you know, and like taking the emphasis off of having certain degrees and backgrounds and shifting it into who has lived experiences and how do those experiences dictate what we're demanding and how we plan to go about it. So Mendes, she brought up a great um, point in hit, making sure that we hit all of groups that are going to be represented. So I was going to go back and ask, do you think it's important for us to make sure that we're inclusive as we're building these laws and building our coalitions to include groups from, from those members and what happens when we aren't able to get groups from those, say the sex workers or um, someone to join the group to help wrap our heads around what that law should look like in our state for them. Mandy, so do you- uh, I said a oh. question. Did you say it again? I was honestly, I was reading the question answers. I'm sorry. It's okay. So I was just asking if you could talk about the importance or if it's even important to have like representations from the sex workers or from other community groups um, and what if you can't find those representations from those groups? What do we do um, as far as trying to make sure we're inclusive of everyone? Well, to me, it, it's extremely important um, to have as many people on board. Like I know in our state, being in New Orleans, like we're often seen as a blue dot in a red state. And that may or may not be true. But one of the things that is true is we must have a coalition that's actually statewide and not just most people in the world is like in somebody else in Baton Rouge, which is the capital city. Um, but part of that conversation about who in the state is represented, it led to a conversation as far as, uh, as, as, far as what other experiences need to be. And so to me, it's important to have people with those experiences and it's important to have people who understand power as well. Because if not, like it's tokenizing people. And unfortunately, we often have experience of what that, that does. Like when you don't actually invest in the leadership and the understanding of power and how it operates. And instead to say, oh, this person is black, this person is trans, this person is queer. Therefore, we'll invest in them, not as a person, but because they check off boxes. And so I think it's also important to 
challenge and develop each other. But at the same time, to me, it, it isn't always possible to have everybody. So how do we make sure we are still accountable, like in terms of sharing our strategies with people? Because like in Louisiana, I agree, like not everyone ha is able to come because some people, it's a fear of being criminalized, which is a real thing. So some people are like, well, I don't want to go, but here's what I would say. So how do you like read, you know, what people have said or talk about, we have people who are part of our coalition who at this point are comfortable coming out. Here's what they want us to do. Here's why we're here because they can't be. So I think it's also a matter of how we frame it, like and how we are engaging people in our communities. And last, I also want to say, like, thinking, you know, as a Black feminist, I'm always making sure that, like, we um, honor the ways that we exist in multiple realms. So, like, sometimes, like, there are people who are Black and sex workers and Black and trans, you know, who are living with HIV and homeless, all of these things. So how do we make sure that we don't have, like, a preconceived idea of what XYZ um, group looks like and then invisibilize people who are actually already at the table who maybe don't fit that um, <laughs> criteria based on what we think a sex worker or someone else should do like should look like if that makes sense. I, I think it's important that we um remember that in inclusive planning does not always mean that every single event or, or action that you take has to involve everybody because sometimes that's not politically savvy. For example, we have um, uh, groups that are uh, part of the reproductive justice movement that support us, but our legislature in Missouri uh, has less than 50 Democrats and it takes 83 votes to pass something out of our House of Representatives um, and basically the Republican Party has a supermajority. The Republican Party positions itself as very strongly, you know, quotation marks, pro-life. And um, uh, therefore, we, we would not insist that our sponsor, who's a Republican from Sykeston, a rural Republican, have someone from, say, Planned Parenthood or, or Repro Action, as, as wonderful as we think those groups are, appear at the press conference where she announced that she was filing the bill that would get her own caucus to be very suspicious of her legislation because they would say, oh, that will hurt us in the election uh, with what they consider to be their base. So those groups know that there are times that they need to step back in order to help us move something forward. But at the same time, we are absolutely committed to only passing strong legislation that does not leave uh, their concerns out. So um, our sponsor knows that if the coalition says we can't stand the bill in this form, we would walk away from it, you know, in order to be um, faithful to the, all the members of our coalition, which is inclusive. But that inclusion doesn't mean at every single event, we sort of like give equal bit billing to every person because we also have to be politically savvy about what, what will play in our state and what will not right now. Um, I'd love to see our state, you know, become different where we can have a sex worker speak at the press conference where we unveil the legislation, but that's probably not going to help us get it passed in Missouri right now. You know, Lauren, I know that partnerships were a significant part of the legislative victory in Washington. And I think navigating some of what JMO is speaking about, about being politically savvy, but also balancing that with, with, making sure that the community is represented. Do you, do you have anything to, to add on, on what partnerships really helped get the ball rolling and some consensus changing in Washington? So we're kind of, we're, we're, we're unique among many of the states in that um, we historically, first of all, historically have um, a democratically dominated legislature and at the moment also have the governorship um, and they tend to be fairly reliable um, 
in terms of the legislature in the community, of course, it's a, a, a very different thing. We have a very, uh, we're a purple state, they say, but we're very blue in a, uh, in the ocean corridor. <laughs> and for, for the most part, there are a few reddish spots and we're very red in the rest of the state. Um, so for us, it's um, partially, it's uh, almost having to stay under the radar um, as much as possible. Uh, so when we're recruiting people on the east side of the state, uh, we have to be, we have to navigate kind of uh, quietly and not making a whole lot of noise. Um, so it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit different for us than I think what a lot of people experience. That said, um, I guess two things come to mind. One was sort of the beginning of our process this year. Um, in, in what would seem like a good way, <laughs> but not so much. Um, we did have a majority, but in the Senate, but a narrow majority. And um, we had four legislators in the Democratic Party who were determined to eliminate the HIV law altogether. And we would talk to them repeatedly, explain why we did not want to do that, that it would open up to more possible prosecutions under the general laws, um, that actually what we were doing was protective. Um, and, uh, you know, they would kind of vacillate and say, okay, we'll go along with it. And in the next breath, uh, they were all up there again. They're going to vote against it because they want to eliminate it. <laughs> and we literally did that up until perhaps a half hour before the final vote in the Senate. It had already passed the House, the final vote in the Senate. Uh, they, they were all back on board, back. They were going to, you know, they wanted, they were going to vote against it. Um, so that was always kind of walking a fine line with our own party, which was kind of a strange experience in and of itself. Um, we also had, uh, on the other side, we had a, we think we have a case that is uh, under investigation in one of our counties. Um, and uh, it is, it involved uh, uh, the uh, arrest and breakup of a sex trafficking ring. And there was concern on the part of the prosecutor about when he, whether any of the victims were uh, had had been had sex with someone who was HIV positive and might have become infected, uh, and dealing with that, and they were minors, um, and so he was investigating this. And one of the representatives, who is uh, staunchly conservative, uh, had somehow come and had a conversation with the prosecutor, and that prosecutor basically told her that they didn't really know yet. They were inv still investigating. They didn't know whether there would be charges or not. My guess from my experience is they were looking at testing both victims as well as, as, well as the um, people that they arrested in that case or the, yeah, that they initially arrested in that case. There were no charges yet. She uh, stood on the floor of the house uh, at the vote and told this very passionate story about this sex trafficking case where two minors were infected and um, there were charges pending and they were going to be arrested and we couldn't possibly pass this bill. Uh, you know, this is what's going to happen all over and so on and so forth, despite all evidence to the contrary, both in the individual case as well as in the history of HIV criminalization in our state. Um, and I think that was used to put a lot of pressure on the uh, folks who were voting to 
on the Democratic side because they literally were threatening them with uh, using that in the uh, House election in November. Uh, you know, basically having ads about them uh, voting to allow uh, people with HIV to infect minors with HIV. Uh, and the end result of that was they're proposing a uh, amendment to our bill that would leave a felony in the bill, in the, in the law, uh, in the assault one, that basically was uh, anyone exposing a uh, exposing and transmitting um, HIV to a minor or vulnerable adult. And in the end, we agreed to let that pass largely because we feel that it's a uh, very unlikely law to be used. Every prosecutor we've talked to on either, whether they're conservative or liberal has um, said they would not use that law uh, to, con to prosecute someone in that case, they would use sexual assault or rape. Uh, you know, so despite their knowing that, they still wanted this. And, and I, again, transmission has been very rare uh, in, in the cases that we've experienced. So uh, that is a way certainly that having to do that dance um, was, you know, was part of our bill, which otherwise was left intact uh, when it was passed. Uh, not an issue that came up in the Senate uh, beyond that. Beyond that. Um, so I think that, that that's certainly the major, uh, like everywhere else we're experiencing, I think in the country, both at, at the state level and national, the partisanship has become a real battle. In a state that used to be very bipartisan, we are no longer. Every vote seems to be large, unless it's, you know, we're going to pet puppies and kittens. <laughs> uh, seems to be pretty, pretty much a bipartisan bill. So uh, that, that's been, you know, my experience in that regard. Um, and I think that's part of why we made the decision. We've been working on this, as I mentioned earlier, for almost 10 years, eight years, very actively, um, some of us. Uh, and uh, about in, in 2015 or 16, the State Department of Health approached us about working with them collaboratively uh, on a bill that they would sponsor. And uh, at that time, despite a very difficult relationship with them because they don't communicate with well with um, those that they don't want to communicate well with, <laughs> you know, if they have an investment in, they're talking to you, but even then. Um, and so we decided to do that. Uh, it really, we felt that the uh, that bringing a bill forward with the Department of Health as the sponsor uh, had a lot, and, and the governor who had signed off on our End AIDS Washington plan in a proclamation, you know, blah, 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 uh, in 2014, um, that that gave us a real leg up with the legislature. And we knew that the first, we'd been there, we'd been there twice already. The first question that the legislators ask is, you know, what does the Department of Health say about your bill? Uh, so if it's their bill <laughs> that, you know, you're starting off ahead, you've already got a governor who's committed to uh, signing this bill. Um, the planning that went into our End AIDS Washington plan, which was in some ways guidance for, for this included, um, I will take almost all the credit, <laughs> uh, it included as one of the major principles that we would modernize the HIV criminal law, uh, that we, we were so much further ahead at that moment, you know, in terms of getting that once we were there, uh, having having a lot stronger case for ourselves than being only community based, and I say only community based in quotes because that's still 
was a huge important part of what we did and 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 getting over the finish line having the community be behind this bill um but it took us a long time <laughs> and i want to encourage all of you who ever said patience before to have a great deal of patience um it you know i i think that Colorado doing this in like two years <laughs> was so unbelievable. I was working with them at the time and it's like, how did you do this? Part of it was their State Department of Health was by their side the whole time, supported them the whole time, gave them a, a physical platform to hold their meetings, went to meetings with the of the legislator, with le le legislature with them. You know, I think that made such an incredible difference, but I don't see that as most people's experience. And so you have to just really be prepared for a long journey um, and find support wherever you can. Seek support to support you. Uh, it can be a lonely journey. <laughs> Ask your family for patience and TLC, <laughs> uh, find someone else to cook dinner. <laughs> um, it just really is, uh, you know, it's a slow process. We had, when we first started this in 2012, we had a couple of educational events that, uh, where we had guests from uh, Ciro Project and CHLP at those events and there were somewhere between 50 and 60 people at each of those events and that was amazing to me. Um, just really amazing. Um, and we put together a, a, a group that would meet on phone calls um, and very quickly that group dissipated down to the five to eight people. And it was almost impossible to get anybody back to the table. And part of that is when there is nothing happening, it, it's really hard to find a way to invest people in the process. So to whatever degree you can engage people or even just keep them, send out emails, tell them what you're doing, let them know that you are there and you're still working on this. Ask them. You know, just ask if there's anyone out there who has an hour, who has five minutes, whatever, you know, and you're interested in helping me do this, you know, however you can, but just, I started a group for HIV positive women in Oregon um, back in 1993, I think it was, and our promise to them is we will be here every Tuesday night for two years, whether you show up or not. And at the end of two years, it was a robust group, but it took, took two years to get there. So just to keep, keep on engaging people in that way and share whatever messages you can, even if you're telling them things that you find from the uh, bi-monthly uh, thing on the states from Deidre now, uh, or quarterly, yeah. You know, how, whatever it is you're telling them about, just keep giving them reason to come back yeah i think that really speaks to you know some of the difficulties that latunja was speaking about especially with a group that hasn't been around as long in the in a state but also you know dealing with building a strong uniform message in the community and engaging those partnerships that you're mentioning lauren but i, I want to give jmo a chance to um, talk about some tips um, to for engaging with lawmakers because we we both we all know that that can be a really strong source of support to really get reforms um, in the door through the door. So I think JMO, would you like to talk about some of your tips? Sure. And uh, Mandisa hit it on the head a while ago when she said, you know, people shouldn't be um intimidated that somehow the lawmakers have all the secret knowledge and the rest of us uh you know don't uh it's, it's important that we learn as much about the process as we can so we we can um we can be successful in our work but uh legislative processes are there because of we the people and we the people need to be in the driver's seat so 
Um, never let the legislators intimidate you and you know make make you think you're not as important. So one tip is um, just as we don't want to be stereotyped for for who we are, some label that we wear. Uh, legislators don't like that either. Uh, there's a you know a million bad jokes about legislators, like how do you tell when a legislator is lying? It's when their lips are moving, you know that kind of thing. You know you you don't want to stereotype legislators because they really are not all the same. And you especially can't assume that you know all about people just because you know what party they belong to. Um, we we had um, uh, every Republican vote yes on on our HIV reform bill uh, in the House Judiciary Committee. Um, uh, meeting. In fact, we we got uh, a 16 to 0 vote. We would have had 17 to 0 if the if, if the Democrat who was missing uh, had been there. And um, we can't tell from party ad uh, identification, uh, you know, who has a, a family member who's living with HIV, um, who uh, um, is uh, a, a lazy jerk who skips their their committee meetings and who's a, a serious public servant that does all that they can to help their constituents out. So don't don't assume that you know all about legislators by just their party label. Um, research things about them so that maybe you can find a point of, of contact with them. You have power as their constituents, so uh, tell them where you live. Put it in your letters or emails, your address. Uh, often they may, may actually look up and see if you are a frequent voter or not. They can't tell how you vote, uh, like what, what people you voted for, but they can tell whether you voted in the primary election, uh, in, in the general elections. They're, they're able to find that uh, in the voters' records that most legislators have right there in their offices uh, at home and, and at the Capitol. Uh, so be sure and let them know that you're their constituent. Um, uh, I saw that one of the Q&A questions was about when people uh, um, who are part of your coalition have one of those, you know, labels that's stigmatizing, like a sex worker, for example, that I, I named earlier. You know, how do you how do you fully include them if they have to stay off of the front lines? Well, they don't fully stay off the front lines. They engage in all the front line work that makes sense for them. They are somebody's constituent. They should talk to their own senator and to their own representative. They should talk to committee members. They may, in that, that in talking to that that person, not need to identify themselves as a sex worker because they have lots of other labels as well that may help them connect with that legislator more. So um, uh, everyone can be on some front line. We just need to figure out which front line is the most effective use of that person, and often they'll know for themselves what's what's their their best front line. But we can group think it where we need to. Um, there will be times you need to talk to legislators that aren't your constituent, that you're not their constituent, like like when they're on a committee. Uh, and so then you need to let them know why you're bothering to talk to them because they mainly want to hear from their constituents. So just go ahead and tell them, you know, I'm here to see you because you're on judiciary and our bill is about to be heard by your committee and I want your yes vote and I'd like to tell you why and then, you know, let them know. Personal lived experience makes all the difference. Uh, we were told in advance by members of House Judiciary last fall that there were at least three of the majority party members we would not be able to get a yes vote from. We did get yes votes from those people, and it's because people living with HIV visited with them twice before the committee hearing happened uh, and did so in a way that really, really helped them understand the issue uh, and form kind of a real heart connection with the person who was speaking. Amir, if you'll go to that next slide. Um, uh, it's because of this thing. A lot of our bad laws are really about uh, prejudice. Um, uh, the thing that breaks down prejudice is repeated positive interactions with the object of your prejudice. So uh, often people living with HIV have other uh, human characteristics that are involved in the oppression of our world. They may be people of color. Uh, they may be women. They may be uh, transgender. Uh, uh, they may be LGBT, um, uh, QI, the full uh, array of letters that we can uh, add to that. Uh, and um, it is in meeting people uh, and learning that, hey, this is another human being like me, uh, that we can get past some of the past oppressive, oppressive behaviors that, that we've had. So those people living with HIV that met with all of the Judiciary Committee members made all the difference in us getting the 16 -0 vote recently uh, and and they were able to tell stories from their own life that that the legislators could really um, like 
think, gosh, if I was in that person's shoes, that would be so painful. You know, they, they could really feel it, uh, feel the story powerfully and how the person told it. So that, that mattered a whole lot. Um, uh, it's important if you're asking a question where you don't know the answer, not to make something up. Uh, uh, in politics, there are a lot of honest brokers, believe it or not. And if they catch you uh, giving them false information or something that's misleading, uh, often they will not have anything to do with you in the future because they'll assume that they can't trust you next time. So just say, I don't know, but I will get back to you and then keep your word and get back to them once you've discovered the answer to the question. Um, you want to make your messages timely. So uh, that's where it's important that we know how the system really works. You know, if, if, if our legislative session runs from January to May, so you don't want to go visit with a legislator in November and ask them to vote for a bill that really died back in May because you're wasting their time and, and you're showing them that you're not a very engaged person. So talk about the thing that's alive right now and the next step that's happening about it, of, uh, it rather than uh, taking the time of a very busy person with something that really can't happen. Um, and then once is not enough. Uh, don't go, just go visit with them once. Um, uh, visit with them until they know you well and start to trust you as their advisor on, on this issue because you really are the expert. So I'll just stop there and um, uh, get everybody into the conversation. Yeah, I think, you know, thank you. Thank you, JMO. I think I have a question for you all. Um, it's something that's come up in our discussion. And then immediately after this, I will open it up to um, some of the questions that's in the Q&A uh, panel. But I think, you know, some of you have spoken about how difficult it is to balance both how important principles, guiding principles and values are to these state networks and broadening connections with advocates um, based on values and a shared common goal. But, but also, I think something that we all know well is that ultimately compromises have to be made and being politically savvy is a skill that we have to express. And I think when you look at the timeline of HIV criminal reforms um, and you see that it, it hasn't been a perfect process, you know, no one's wagging their finger at advocates who are making tough calls, but there have been reforms that haven't really fully made a, a meaningful improvement in the lives of people living with HIV, especially if you think about strategies that might not apply to um, people who are overrepresented in arrests and prosecutions. So how, how would you handle that tension? How would you handle that tension between your guiding principles and values that brought you to the group in the first place, but also understanding that when we look back at HIV criminal law reforms, some of them expanded the scope of prosecution. Some of them kept felony penalties. Um, how do you handle that? Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> I, this is fresh in my mind. <laughs> um, I think that uh, there, there, there are so many things that go into this. It's not, it's something certainly that we had discussed in the past. We always knew it was a possibility we might have to make a compromise. Um, I think the hardest part for us of our compromise was that it was completely disingenuous and it was political. Um, it's just, it's so distasteful. <laughs> it is so not what our democracy is about that that was really extremely difficult. It was offensive. Um, and they were boldly clear about that's what they were doing. Um, but nonetheless, there we were. Um, our sponsors basically said to us that it was, it was at a point that we either accepted the compromise or the bill was dead. And we, you know, we discussed it a lot. There was a lot of heartache. There was a lot of anger. Um, 
And by and large, it was really weighing the greater good. And we felt that the most likely part of our, our bill, our bill um, revised the entire STD code for the Department of Health. So this was one part of the bill. Um, and uh, the, the, the criminalization piece that was moved into the STD code and is a, a, and is a misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor, depending on the circumstances, is really, really good. And it's well written. It will be, I think, it adheres to all the principles that we've talked about from the beginning. And I think one of the things that makes 10 years more palatable is that over the years, I think we've uh, grown and learned a lot and refined our language to the point where I think even though the ideas are the same, we have a better bill. Um, and who knows the next time we would have this opportunity. And so I just really think looking at all the cases that have gone before, none of them would have been affected by the compromise, um, by the amendment. And um, we are going to save a lot of heartache for a lot of people and hopefully heal a lot of lives. Thank you, Lauren. Um, in Louisiana, um, and I'm also excited to see um, some folks who are also in the coalition are on this call. We had um, a different situation um, in terms of like the politics of, of the Deep South are different, um, but it was a similar situation in that we, our coalition, which was actually in its top years, it had been around for two years, if that, had to, had to also answer some hard questions in terms of a legislator who actually had been introducing some pretty progressive bills outside of this one, really wanted like as far as to shift what he saw as the problem, but A, uh, because he didn't have a deep understanding of what actually was happening on the ground as far as who's criminalized and ways to stop that, B, he wasn't willing to engage in us as the experts who were continuously telling him, yes, uh, we see your passion. We have some ideas as to how we can work with you and make this better, um, we were in a position of having to publicly oppose a law that actually we were worried was going to further criminalize our people. And um, it, it still passed. And, uh, and a part of how we deal with that is we document um, on the listserv, like every time like a new case of somebody who was arrested under the uh, the statute and we like make sure that, you know, uh, they're aware, look, you change this, here's who's still being criminalized under it. Because like, that's how we believe he's accountable to us um, in terms of you want, like you said this wouldn't happen and we're showing you that it's happened more than once across the state. But in response, like how our coalition is dealing with it um, is we decide like to build a larger base. Like for us, we saw very quickly, it couldn't just be the ASOs in the room. A, because if we're being honest, not all ASOs are actually in support of modernization. We don't want to have that conversation, but it is a fact. And we saw that we had to build with larger criminal justice organizations, um, which then it requires us to make sure our work is located within a, you know, a larger framework of, a, of, of addressing criminalization. We also saw it was important as far as to build with anti-violence organizations in the state, because that actually was something that was actually a big opposition to us, is the ways in which sexual assault in particular is used to actually grow HIV criminalization. So it was important to us, it's like, oh, okay, I see what's happening. How do we 
build with them and actually show these laws make it harder on people who are survivors of sexual assault, sexual abuse. Um, and we also, you know, have realized that, especially again, here in the Deep South, we have such a long history and legacy of voter suppression that it was also important like to build with voting rights organizations. And actually that work is ongoing. And so that's part of how we are responding to this is to build a bigger base. Um, also like to educate prosecutors and to educate law enforcement in the short, acknowledging that is not a long-term solution. It is not the end, but acknowledging, as someone said, I think it was Lauren, this took 10 years or so. So acknowledging that as we do this long-term work, how do we also stop what's happening right now. And we also realize again, law enforcement officers who have their own slate of problems that, you know, hopefully um, we're trying to address as well, also don't know about HIV AIDS in 2020 as prosecutors as well. So we also saw it as a chance to continue to educate people as well. So um, it's something that I think is, has been very important in our coalition and it's something that is definitely going to always be a concern as we move forward so thank you for the question yeah we'll we'll see how we manage it here in missouri because the bill that came out of committee is not in the shape we want it to be in the end but but our sponsor had an agreement with house leadership that the amendments will happen on the house floor instead of in committee so uh, there are things that we want to change. We will see if we can get those changed. Uh, sometimes you have to let a bill move the next step uh, in the process with some flaws in it to keep it alive, but you also have to know when to pull the plug <laughs> so that it doesn't pass in a form that, that is abhorrent to you. So uh, we will see if we hit that, that, uh, that balance. One of the things that we are considering at this point is if we can have only one felony in the bill, but write it so airtight that no one is ever charged with it, would that be okay? You know, uh, if, if it's, if it's um, uh, you know, written, well, written in a way that somebody would have to have the intent and do something pretty terrible to get charged with, with a felony, uh, it's something that we don't think is going to happen um, in the, really, it's just not. So. And for Arkansas, we're still in very early planning stages. Um, I do know that we have our HIV elimination task force that meets monthly. And so part of that group is made up of our Arkansas Department of Health, who has now taken initiative to create a group that we've been conversating with to get them to join our Arkansas initiative that we already have going um, with the Project Justice Project. So um, we are having some preliminary conversations with Arkansas Department of Health since they are talking about how they can work with us to um, reform our laws. And so we also have our human rights campaign as well that has a coalition that's working to do some stuff. So we're trying to figure out how we can merge all those groups. So we're not as far as in the process as others are, but we're still working and trying to get everything pulled together. Um, some of the challenges we've had um, have been, um, and I asked the question earlier about inclusiveness of other groups. We've really struggled with trying to get others um, to be a part of the group and even from other areas of our state. So Arkansas is very rural. So we're made, most of the coalition is central Arkansas region. And even when we've done outreach to others uh, across the state, it's been very difficult to get buy-in from others. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we've been experiencing, um, just trying to get people to stay engaged and reaching out to those partners that really should be a part of those conversations. Some of the things that we've done to try and fix that is like just doing surveys to like try and get at least the people that are living with HIV that don't feel like they or fear coming out or um, being on these phone calls because of stigma. We've given them surveys to try and get some of their input for some of this. So um, that's kind of where Arkansas is right now. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know, I, I think building that network of, of strategic partnerships with either state DOH or, uh, or different networks like Mandis is talking about uh, where there are maybe unlikely allies like um, um, different support groups for um, survivors of domestic violence where you might not think that naturally that's the right place to, to ally with when um, finding support to fight HIV criminal laws. But I think this again goes to one of JMO's um, tips to engaging with lawmakers that might really pass on to just doing this organizing work period, which is we shouldn't make assumptions or, or stereotypes and we never know exactly where we'll find the right types of support and allies to grow our networks. So I think with that, we're at the hour. So I, I really want to, you know, please if, give a virtual round of applause to our panelists who spent some time here today to give us some feedback and some insight into the best practices to reform HIV criminal laws in their states and it's work that they're embroiled in in their states and uh thank you all so much thank you latunja and jamo and lauren and manti and mandisa thank you so much and thank you everybody for taking a little bit of your time out of your day to join us for this discussion um thank you all and i'm, I'm seeing a lot of thank you messages down in the q a so i hope everyone sees that and um Till next time with the PJP Advisory Group.